I have no problem calling our next honoree the nicest person in television news. And here's a fun fact. When Catherine Garcia anchored her very first, I don't know if you remember this, when Catherine anchored her very first newscast in San Diego, it was a holiday. You know, they put all, the bosses put all the weekend guys on the, the big holidays. <laughs> anyway, um, it was Labor Day 2000 and something, and I was lucky enough to be her co-anchor. And, um, you know, you just knew that she was going to have amazing success here in, in San Diego. And as much as I love you, Catherine, I have to say, sometimes it was, I don't know, I was filled with anxiety every time I had to anchor with you because <laughs> she is so good. She never makes a mistake. Never. And so when you screw up, and believe me, I did my share of screwing up, it sticks out like a sore toe. But that is a compliment to you, Catherine. <laughs> Monica Dean could probably speak toward that. And for Monica, I have no problem calling Monica the nicest person in television news. <laughs> Monica is going to introduce Catherine. But first, Monica is going to be introduced by Roy Devine, who I consider who I consider the nicest person in television news. And I have to make a mistake. Never, never Roy and I go back so far. And we, are, we have, we have shared, yeah, hold on, hold on. Roy and I, we share similar career paths as reporters, longtime co-anchors. We both got booted off the four o'clock news at the same time. <laughs> what else? <laughs> All right, come on up, Roy. <laughs> uh, Artie, thank you so much. Um, it is my honor to be here for Catherine and for all of you. Um, it's so good to see everyone, and it is so great to hear Devin and Elsa, um, and who's the third one? Eric. Eric. Oh, yeah, you, you're sitting at my table. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, to, hear your, to hear about your backgrounds. Just, it's been great storytelling and just amazing background, so thank you for sharing. And I know that I have lost some credibility. I'm looking at Greg Dawson right now. I know I've lost some credibility with most of you about my inability to be brief. That's why I'm here. That's why she's here. Exactly. We plan this. Um, but my, attention, my intention really is to be quick. I just wanted to say a few words to Catherine the nicest person in news, really, other than Monica and, and I. <laughs> I forgot about you, Monica. Um, yeah. Um, Catherine, Paul Kruger and I nominated you, along with help from Mary Ellen, who dug into the archives, and Tad, who dug into the, our house and looked for all the Emmys that I think are probably around, or surreptitiously looked for them and got back to us. He, he, we nominated you not because you're old, Amen. <laughs> but Catherine, old is relative. Just saying. Uh, I know, Catherine, that in all your humility, she's also not only the nicest person, she's also so humble. I had this fantasy, see, now I'm ad living. Whoops, oops, oops. Uh, bring her in, bring her in. I had this fantasy this morning that she was driving here thinking, oh, I really don't deserve this, and I don't want to go, and oh, I have to give a speech. And she's just, she's just so humble. And I know you're thinking that. It's, it's just my time. I'm an imposter. Thank you for that word. I liked it. I thought that too, and I, and I think that we're getting the vibe from the people who have received this award in the past. I thought that too in the beginning. Oh, um, I'm just old. I think Ken Kramer, you are the one that told me that I was going to get the Silver Circle. Um, I hope, Catherine, that day for me was very, very special, and I, can, I hope it is for all of you, but Catherine, I want you in particular to look around, see, see all the people who love you, and just admire you so much. I hope that you can take all of this in because you, Catherine Garcia, are the epitome of a civil cir silver circle inductee. I kick words, she does not. <laughs> silver circle inductee, Catherine Garcia, we love you. And now for the details of why <laughs> you're here. This was only supposed to be like 15 seconds, but um, I kept putting in green things. Okay, Catherine Garcia, we love you. 
toss it over to Monica Dean. Thank you. Wow. What an honor to be up here. Catherine is incredibly deserving of this honor. Her membership in this prestigious club of journalists will only serve to make the silver circle brighter because that is what she does. That is what I've always known her to do. See, I'm not a member of the silver circle, but Catherine and I, we've been in a few circles together at NBC7 over the years. I first stepped into her professional circle 20 years ago. Hard to believe, we were both 10 at that time too. <laughs> and from day one, I have always admired her professionalism and her poise. She is the consummate journalist. She's prepared, she asks great questions, and she always seems to know what to say. She's always had a reputation for being a strong writer, an excellent reporter, and a polished anchor. She is a trusted newswoman who reports the news with sincerity, humility, and authenticity. Her commitment to the responsibility that we all have as journalists has always made NBC shine brighter. 12 years ago, our circle got a little bit closer when I had the privilege of sharing the seat next to her on the anchor desk every day at 4 p.m. on NBC7. And together, we have reported pretty much every type of news imaginable to our viewing audience. We've covered, I was listing them off in my mind, we've covered wildfires, wars, crime, elections, natural disasters, riots, scandals, controversy, court rulings, police chases, scientific breakthroughs. There was a pier on fire the other day. I don't know if you saw it, but we spoke for over an hour about it. Oh yeah, and a global pandemic. We anchored the news together remotely from our homes together. Who could forget about that? We have really had the front row seat to the best and worst of humanity for approximately 2,760 newscasts. Wow. And if you wanna ask me about my formula, thank you, of how I came up, I actually think it's a few more, but you can ask me later, I actually tallied up and I believe that is accurate. Catherine's passion and dedication and talent for this career of communication have inspired me in more ways than I can express. I have watched her filter information during breaking news on the fly and deliver the essentials to our viewing audience so organized and effortlessly you couldn't have scripted it better. I've seen how focused, thoughtful, and prepared she is on a daily basis and I've learned so much from watching her. I've marveled at her deep dive reporting on topics like mental health and the fentanyl crisis, and we've celebrated the awards that she has received for that and for so many other things so well deserved over the years. And so when you have the honor of working so closely with someone like Catherine, whose standard of excellence is so high, you can't help but want to up your game. She helps all of us who are close to her shine brighter. But perhaps the most treasured circle that I've shared with Catherine has been the personal circle. The connection that we've had off camera, during commercial breaks, behind the scenes. Our afternoon weekday routine is more regular and predictable than any appointment I have with any family member by far. <laughs> Behind the scenes, there has been so much laughter, occasionally tears, lots of makeup room discussions. What happens in the makeup room stays in the makeup room. <laughs> We've celebrated personal milestones like the birth of our children, Jackson, significant birthdays. At times on the set, we complete each other's sentences and we often randomly wear the same color on the same day without even planning it. We can read each other, other's facial expressions without saying a word. And for all of the talking that we do, we're so close and familiar with one another that we're even comfortable in silence together. I am forever grateful for that circle of friendship and for the countless times that Catherine has been faithfully by my side as a witness to whatever crazy thing happens on or off the air. And believe me, you can talk to both of us, some crazy stuff happens sometimes. And I've often said to Catherine, in this crazy business, it is incredibly validating to have a witness. 
<laughs> this amazing wife, mother, sister, daughter, friend who loves sports, especially tennis. She loves cats, otters. We ex exchange a lot of otter memes. <laughs> Tea. Just the other day, I found out she has a love for red lobster biscuits. Who knew? I'm still learning things after 20 years. I know she hates cliches. She recently overcame her fear of birds. You can ask her about that. She's taught me so, so many things. But most of all, Catherine, you have taught me that life is better and brighter in circles together. My life is brighter because of all the circles that I have shared with you. You are a shining addition to the Silver Circle. Cheers to you, Catherine Garcia, my beautiful and talented friend. Wow. Um, I just wanted to start by saying thank you to Natus for putting on this amazing event. I know it takes a lot of work, Mary Ellen, from you as well, um, and to our general manager, Missy Crawford, who supported our table. I truly appreciate all of you out there who make this possible. Um, so six of us are lucky enough to be accepting this honor today. Suzanne, Gustavo, Devin, Eric, and Elsa, congratulations to all of you as well. Elsa, I've really enjoyed our time in the community together. Um, and I've admired the stories you've told about San Diego. I think Devin and Eric, we're all talking about being storytellers, right? And that's, that's really kind of the theme. Um, I think my job boils down to storytelling, and I thought a lot about the story I wanted to share today, and I realized that, well, maybe I'm here because of my work. Um, my story is really about the people who've been by my side while I did that work. Um, these people have taught me three really important things. Gratitude and a deep love for family, a strong worth eth ethic, and a responsibility to the greater good. So I figured I'd start where a lot of stories start, right, at the beginning. And for me, that is the year 1970. <coughs> <laughs> Let's concede the 1970s because to be in this job for 25 years plus, you know, it's got to be around that ballpark. I had the enormous luck to be born to my parents, Irene and Terry, who are here today. My dad served as an officer in the Air Force for more than 30 years, and there's no person in my life who has shown me day in and day out what it means to have a strong work ethic and to work for a greater good. For you, that was serving our country and protecting our country, so thank you. My mom is the matriarch of our extended family. I mean, we literally call her the matriarch. And she is the perfect example of the importance of family. She's the glue that holds ours together. But also, after being an amazing stay-at-home mom for many years, she went back to work as a civilian on military bases. And she became like this respected boss lady, no joke. Like, generals were scared of her, they said. <laughs> So she's been an amazing example. They wrote, both really have been my greatest source of love and support. So thank you for that. OK, let's fast forward now. We're going to go to the 1980s. At the age of six, I thought I was the main character in our family story. But then my sister came along. <laughs> if you haven't had the pleasure of meeting my little sister, you really should. Jacqueline is the color yellow. She came into our life with a big smile and a big personality. When I was in high school, she used to do cartwheels across the living room in front of my boyfriends. Like, that was really true. And now as adults, she continues to bring brightness to everything we do as a family, and I'm really happy she's here, too, and that she moved to San Diego. All right, then it was 1992. I was a freshman studying broadcast journalism at yeah. USC, yes. <laughs> and I went to this party, and I spotted a guy and before I even spoke to him, I said, he's going to be my husband. <laughs> and I know that sounds nuts. And it continued to be a little bit, you know, crazy. Because one day, I said to him, I just started crying. And I said, I really want to be with you. 
but I'm going to be a reporter and I'm going to have to leave LA and how's that going to work? And amazingly, he didn't run as fast as he could away. He stayed. Uh, and he stayed when I moved to Atlanta, and he stayed when I moved to El Paso, and then we moved together to Austin and Dallas. And I really think that the big reason that I made it through all of this is because we share not only a respect for a strong work ethic, but also a tremendous love for our families. And I couldn't have done any of it without you, so thank you. Um, <laughs> I do have to say, I know you were really happy when we were coming back to Southern California in 2003, like no doubt, Southern California boy through and through. And the reason I got to land at NBC San Diego, well, there are two of them and they're both here today, I'm really excited to say. Uh, Phyllis Schwartz was the general manager then, and I know many of you know her, yes. Phyllis, you were such a champion of diversity and you were somebody who was really working for that greater good of journalism for sure. I was always so grateful for your support and you were always so supportive of me, except for there was this one time. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this. You sent me an email and like almost word for word, I think I remember it. You said, while you are usually a shining star on television, today your hair is not. <laughs> And you were right, it was a really, really bad hair day. <laughs> Thank you for, for your support. <laughs> was that? I, we, we did have the same hair guy for many years, it's true. Uh, so the news director who hired me in 2003 is still my news director. Like, how many people can say that? Yeah. Greg Dawson um, has led us through countless elections and scandals and natural disasters and a pandemic. Um, but he's also shown our newsroom that no matter how important our work is and no matter how much people count on us, our top priority should also always be family. You have always been so gracious when I've needed time away with my family. You even let me work part time when that's what our family needed and that has truly made all of the difference. So thank you. And by the way, his devotion to his three amazing daughters means that he is uniquely equipped to talk to news anchors about wardrobe and makeup and hair and all kinds of things. <laughs> Thank you both. So while my arrival in San Diego in 2003 was a big deal in my story, that year was also really important in San Diego's story. It was the year of the Cedar Fire. And I had only been here about a month when I found myself out on the front lines in awe of amazing photographers and veteran journalists who really showed me how you cover a wildfire. Um, it was really thrilling and it was rewarding to be a part of that team. And that's really the thing about NBC7. We've always been a team of good journalists, strong journalists. And I'm really happy that so many of you are here today. Rory Devine, you are such a dear friend. And I've always admired your work ethic. So here's the thing about Rory. Like, if they would have sent her out to cover, you know this cliche story, think Anchorman, where it's like a water, water skiing squirrel, right? We know this. If they would have sent Rory out to cover that, she would have not only, like, talked to the squirrel in a way you would never know, you would have found, you would have found like, the squirrel's long-lost parents. <laughs> and you would have gotten them to cry on camera. <laughs> and then you would have told it in the way that you had all of us sobbing. Because you just, that's what you do. You work so hard. And you would do that every single day. And I really admire that about you. And I thank you for nominating me for the Silver Circle. Um, thank you. Paul Kruger. I'm also really thankful for your support in my nomination. And I admire you as a big time fighter for the greater good. In the newsroom, you were always fighting for the people who had been wronged. You've been fighting for justice and for journalism with a big J. And now in your civic duties that you have now in your retirement, you continue to do it. So you're amazing. Artie Ojeda, I was so excited when they said you'd be emceeing today. <laughs> and yes, of course, I knew it was the first newscast. That's what I was going to say, stealing my lines. But it was really fun. Every time we got to anchor together, we would gossip, <laughs> tell stories. You'd always make me laugh. And I truly admire your devotion to your family. And I know you spoil those grandbabies and it's really great to see. Oh no. Oh, I thought you went to the restroom. Donna M. Stewart. <laughs> you have been a cheerleader 
for me from day one. I know it, and I really appreciate it. You also are the only person who's ever gotten me able to play in a tennis pro-am. Like, that was amazing, so thank you. And thank you for being here. It really means a lot that you came. Eric Naso. <laughs> my, my favorite promo shoot, we go back long enough that we shot news stories together, but promos mostly. And there was this one day, and I had spent like an hour and a half with a makeup artist. She was doing her best to try. And I walk into the studio. I walk into the studio in downtown when we were still in downtown. And he like looks at me through his camera, and then he goes over like this. He's, so you decided not to wear makeup for this one? <laughs> but that's. I mean, he's he just always makes you feel so comfortable and breaks breaks the mood with a joke. I hope. And the lighting, yeah, the lighting, man, that's, that's bomb. So it's been great to work with you all these years. Mari Payton, my Trojan sister, um, well, I have always been so, so impressed and proud of your investigative journalism and all you've accomplished there. Um, I just think that your recent line changes are so admirable because you've done them for your love of family. And you should be so proud of that. And thank you for being here today. Monica Dean, you, Mari, and I started working at NBC at about the same time, and now we always laugh. We're like, oh my gosh, how do all these old people get to be our age? <laughs> you've been by my side through so much of my life, and you've been literally sitting less than a foot from me for approximately 3,120 hours. <laughs> See, journalists can do math. <laughs> Simple math. <laughs> Yeah, that's 12 years of co-anchoring the four together. Um, but we share, as you were so kind to talk about, um, so much more than work. Um, we put our families first, and our families I consider the same. You work so hard. That's just what you do. And more than probably anybody that I know or ever will, you live your life in constant spiritual pursuit of the greater good. And I've, it's been just an honor to work with you. So many of you remember very clearly the next big wildfires happened in 2007. That was the year that my son was born. Um, I actually came back a day early from maternity leave to help the team cover the 2007 wildfires. And I found myself in this news truck with a photographer and we were racing toward the Harris fire. We were down this, it was this tiny road in the Petrero area. And the blackness, the smoke, it was so thick like we couldn't even really see where we were going. And at that moment, it hit me. I was like, what am I doing? I have a tiny human being that I want, that I need to be there for. This is crazy. But it turns out being a parent feels like that a lot of times, right? Like this, this at your core worry about the safety of your family and going way too fast into the unknown. Jackson, you've made me a better journalist. Um, You've inspired me to report on issues that matter and that keep families safe. And you've given me a whole new way to see the world. You are kind, you're empathetic, you're creative, and you're so bright. And I know that you will have your own unique story to tell. I love you. All right, so now it's 2024, and I, I really can't believe that a good chunk of my story is already in the books. For now, I'll just be grateful to continue to tell our community story with my uh, NBC7 colleagues. And I'm not really sure where the story ends for me. We all know that this business is changing so crazy fast, and who knows what it's going to look like three or five years from now. Here's what I do know. Our society needs journalists. <laughs> we need storytellers to inform to enlighten, to hold accountable, and yes, to celebrate what's happening in our communities. And I think really my greatest wish for storytellers that come after me is that as they do that work, they're as blessed as I have been to be surrounded by people who value family, who have a strong worth ethic, and who know that we should all feel a sense of responsibility to work for the greater good. Thank you all very much. Thank you.